it's uh it's a very pleasant 5 p.m here all right uh i'm gonna get uh, this started um other folks will continue to join as they do um hey everyone this uh hacker nights is hosted by my company multi-process labs you can see in the background uh oh okay, that's not working. um the zoom chats are not recorded um so if you have questions you can ask them in there but if if you want to have a long-term conversation, there's a dedicated channel on the um, multi-process Discord that you can see hopefully on the background there. Um, so feel free to join that if you'd like. Um, this recording is also, this, this Zoom is being recorded for YouTube. Um, so uh, I'll send out a link on the Meetup page and in that Discord channel when uh, this is done and I have a chance to upload it. Um, just a, a quick, uh, yeah, actually, that's all I want to say for now. Um, so first up, I think we've got Rasmus um, talking about your programming language and go ahead and uh, take it away. Yeah, hey, uh, first first time here and uh, um, excited to talk a little bit about one of my little side projects that I've been working on for about five years at this point, on and off. Um, it's also my first time being uh, on Hacker Nights. So, uh, you know, thank you, Phil, for inviting me. And I hope to, uh, to join many times in the future as uh, an eager listener, observer, whatever you call that. Um, so I think, I think the deal is we're going to spend about 20 minutes. Is that right? So about 10-ish something minutes, maybe I'll talk a little bit about what the project and then maybe 10 minutes Q&A. 20 minutes before Q&A, so you, if you want. You don't have to use that whole time, but uh, yeah, it's a, whatever you'd like, just at most 20 minutes. No problem. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, okay, I've zoomed everything in now, so I hope everything is good, but if, if there's any text that I'm pointing out and it's hard to read, like just shout out here or in the chats, and I'll make sure to, um, to adjust that. Um, yeah, so... Um, CO is what I call it. Um, I'm currently working on the third version of it. <laughs> like most hobby projects, you know, it started out as sort of like, a, hmm, I wonder what it would feel like with a language that looks or feels like X. And I've been into making little hobby languages and little compilers and stuff for a really long time. Um, and uh, I think one of my first languages that that ended up actually working out. Let's see, GitHub. I was just going to cut straight into the CEO thing, but I think maybe a little bit of background first. Um, so here is, I love to zoom in a little bit. So Move was one of my first languages that uh, was used by anyone else than me. And this I wrote in, I think, 2010, something like that. And we ended up using this for a lot of stuff when I worked at Facebook. Um, and it was really just this, like the compiler itself is, is an epic hack, uh, but the syntax is something along these lines. Um, and uh, the first version of Framer, you know, the design tool was like written in this and stuff like that. So I've been doing this for a while, uh, never in any professional capacity, always as a, just a side gig of fun hobby. So CO, this is sort of like what the current language kind of looks like to get a little taste of it. Um, it, uh, it is inspired by a lot of things. I pick bits and pieces that I like. I like Go a lot. I like some things of C. I like, like aspects of Python. There's a lot of languages that I think have really neat, uh, you know, syntactical features, semantic features, so you sort of mechanical features, like white space for indentation, for example, like in CO, you can, you can just leave out curly braces, you can use indentation and that is the same thing. It's equivalent. You can run it through a formatter and you can say, give me indentation or code braces. Um, semicolons follow the same rules as uh, Go. So if there's a if there's a line break, like after the zero here, um, uh, then a semicolon is automatically inserted into the scanning stream of, of tokens, depending on what that last token you scan was. So if it's uh, an open parenthesis, for example, there's no semicolon being asserted, right? So you can type a, a parenthesis here and then a line break and nothing weird happens. 
And then parenthesis on the other hand will cause a semicolon to be inserted. Same for like, you know, an integral literal or like a name or something like that. So that's sort of like kind of what it looks like. Uh, this web page has a little bit of information if you want to go shake it out later. Um, so uh, I want to show you also like the first version of this. So the current version, this is the current version here. And I'm going to jump in and have a look at that in a second. The first version I wrote in TypeScript. Like also I'm the kind of person who don't like to use third party code. So, you know, I don't use any, any of the uh, uh, like third party libraries and stuff like that. So I had to, you know, write my own like path parser and stuff like that as a basic stuff, kind of boring, but so this is kind of where I started. This is similar. It doesn't use uh, white space indentation. This is probably about three years old, uh, something like that. It has a little playground where you can play around with it. Um, so we can do, and the compiler is like pretty quick. I think it does all of this in a few microseconds in TypeScript, which is, or whatever JavaScript core I'm used to so far here. So it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty cool. It gives you a little feedback and stuff like that. Here I also wrote my own like code generator and uh, SSA optimizer, um, you know, register allocator and stuff like that. You can do this. It'll tell you which registers are allocated. So that was a really fun experience. Like uh, most of these hobby projects are happen or whatever. <laughs> I do them because I, uh, I want to learn something and doing like this version of CO, uh, I ended up learning a lot about things that goes into code generation optimization and stuff, that, which I never worked on before. Before I used LLVM or something like that to just do sort of like, hey, take care of like generate me some x86 code or something like that. So that was interesting. Uh, I even wrote, let's see, I think I have a link here somewhere. Where is it? I wrote a little visualization for myself for the, um, uh, for the algorithm that I'm using for register allocation. So it can, you know, in, in this case, let me reload this. So in this case, we have some input here, you know, A is one, B is two, uh, then D is B plus A and so on, right? Uh, and then this is- just hear this, but every time I ask, mom, mom, bye. Kristen, can you mute? Thank you. Um, so, Limeness here in this column just shows like at, at a certain point, at this point, like which variables are alive, right? So here C and D are alive. E is not alive anymore because E is not used beyond this. Uh, if you worked on compiling, my find is familiar. And then this uh, third column here says, you know, for variable A, B, and C, or local, whatever you want to think of them as, like uh, variable A, B, C, and D, and so on, where will its value live, right? So either it, it lives in a register and you have a limited set of registers. In this example, there are three. You can just increase the number of registers here, but three is interesting for this example. And when you run out of registers, if you have more things alive, like this row, for example, has four things alive, you can't keep four things into three buckets, right? So you have to spill them into memory. So how do you how do you do that? And so there's this, uh, I think it's a pretty popular algorithm used, uh, Shaitin Briggs. It's a Briggs variation on the Shaitin like graph coloring algorithm. And so this visualizes it because you know, my head was like, what's going on? I read all these papers and I tried to like, you know, write a couple of implementations and I was struggling a bit and I put this together to just help me think. And so you can step it through. So the first thing it does is to just pick like any of these, let's see, it picks, it picks the strongest one, the weakest one. I think it starts with the weakest one, the one with the fewest edges. Um, and then it keeps going. So fewest edges, fewest edges, fewest edges, and it puts it on the stack. And then the next step, what it does is that it just does the inverse. So it puts the spec and it takes a register and it, it assigns it, does the next thing, puts it back, restores its edge and picks the next, next register. And it keeps doing this. And now it has to spill E and then it can reuse A because D is unused because there's no edge here. Anyhow, I'm not going to go into like the, you know, what this algorithm does, right? I just wanted to show you that I made this little visualization just to, to, uh, to learn about this stuff. Um, 
Okay. So I think because I'm just talking a lot and it's hard when you talk like this and you don't see an audience and you don't hear anything. So I just want to like quickly pause here and see if there are any questions. That uh, register allocation visualization is super cool. Uh, maybe I'm sure that you've tweeted about it. I've just missed it, um, but I, I'm definitely going to point people to that next time someone comes asking. I can I can post these links to uh, I don't know to maybe the Discord later. Yeah, I I had a, another question about your uh, maybe it was your previous version. You showed some um, some generated code that was formatted with S expressions. What was that? Uh, was that your own IR or yeah? What is this? This thing in the middle. Yeah. Yes, so let's see if we type some stuff, we can see where it's being changed, like here it's being changed. Yeah, so this is a representation of the AS tree, the abstract syntax tree. So this is this is what the, uh, after the parser is done, the parser puts this together from looking at the source text. And then, so you can think of it as a, a movement here. Sorry, my mouse cursor is probably really small, but you can think of it as a movement from here to here to here. So there's some chunk of code here that like, you know, tokenizes the source text, parses it, does semantic analysis, like this early version, you know, has generics and all kinds of like templates and stuff like that. And so it, it does, you know, type checking, like if this were to be, um, do I have, a, let's see, 32, I can't remember what I call it, is so old. Uh, Okay, so there we go. And now the error is gonna going to be cannot mutate the exit. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's probably a bug. Anyhow, the point here is that um, it will do type checking to to make sure that things are um, compatible and stuff like that. And then you get this ASD tree, and I just, usually I print them out in S expression because it's just really easy to visualize as a tree, easy to script and stuff, and and do like build unit tests and stuff. And then this, of course, it's in memory. It's just some data structure. It's not an S expression being used in memory. And then there is all the code that like does code generation optimization. Um, the, so the code generation stuff will, let me uncheck this, uh, will read this. And then it will build this SSA code. That's just like straight line code. Um, this goes from, it's, it's like, it's, a, it's similar to assembly. If you've ever worked on that kind of stuff, it goes from top to bottom and labels for um, a control form. And <clears throat> it will have kind of pseudo instructions, if you will. So this will say, you know, let variable zero be ar this argument zero here, variable, you know, value one be this and so on. And then as to say, a static single assignment, you you sort of, uh, you only bind to a variable or like a name exactly once. You can never, you can, can change the logical meaning of a value, which kind of makes optimizations easy. And then it's not on the screen here. You can see it's changing. Then the optimizer like runs on this code, right? So this is like trying to optimize this code. is like really tricky and complicated. Optimizing SSA form is much, much easier in comparison. So that's what it's doing next. That's um, it's optimized in that. So here it realizes that value two is not used. Uh, value seven is not used. So it just removes those. It probably does other stuff too. And then finally the code gen phase also goes and, and edits this and does things like register allocation and stack pointers, sets up stack pointers and stuff like that. Someone else in Discord asked um, which algorithm is being used to eliminate unused registers. Uh, Shaitan Briggs. That was the visualization thing I showed you earlier. Um, and go this thing here. I don't have um, Discord open, but I can drop it into the Zoom chat right now. I can figure out how to do that. So there it is, I posted it in, in the Zoom uh, chat window. Cool, I'm gonna move on. If there are any other questions, just shout out. Um, okay, so 
I have zoomed up. Usually the screen is, is a pretty big screen. I zoomed it in. So I have to hang back a little bit, not to be startled by the large text. But I hope you can see this. Um, so before, so this is the current version that I'm currently working on. Uh, I also got, so I have a, a new laptop. My main laptop is broke. So unfortunately I can't show you the version one here. This is kind of broken, but I can show you the latest version and the oldest version. So what we just looked at on the web page. So all of that being TypeScript is pretty easy to just, you know, compile as a JavaScript and just run that in a web browser. But I am just running it locally in Node.js. Um, and, you know, we can change things and we can save this. And as I'm saving it here, let's see, one, two, three. So here's a number that says 20. And now when I hit save here, it's at one, two, three. So you see what, what I'm typing here in the source text gets automatically updated as I am um, editing here. And uh, I got a lot of debug printing and like, also this is a thing usually I do and pretty much independent of programming language, I have it set up like this. I get live feedback as I'm editing source code. So I have it continuously as running, rebuilding and executing as my source code changes. And the other thing I do is that I tend to just have unit tests integrated into the executable. Uh, this is true for, for the current version too. This is just a native executable. You'll see a bunch of unit tests being run every time I run the program. Yes, and the debug builds. That for me has been like just a, a super neat way of, of working. What I have to remember to go and run a suite of tests before committing and stuff like that. And it caught so many, so many of my terrible bugs. So that's what's going on there. And then it just runs, it parses stuff. If it, you know, if we do make some mistakes here, it's going to complain surely. You know, missing, let's see. Yeah, it's it's not very pretty. We'll look at the more recent version soon. So this is the TypeScript version. And here we can see the actual code that he generates in the end. Um, here, the instructions have become like specific. So um, here's an integer add 32 bit instruction and so on. Uh, and here's that SSA, but with color. And then when I kind of abandoned this project or this version of this project, I was working on the, um, uh, the code generator, and let's see, I can't even remember where that is anymore. Uh, oh, maybe it's here in Assembler. I don't know. Yeah, somewhere here. And then, you know, I <laughs> uh, put together an x86 uh, Assembler for this project. And that took me a real long time. And I was like, shit, this, this is the worst. Um, x86 has a lot of complicated things in it. And so at one point I was like, maybe I should just go to ARM64 or ARC64 which is a little bit simpler. X86 has, you know, if you're familiar with instruction sets, X86 has um, um, this thing called REX, which is this like our extension. So X86 of course came about like, you know, 16 bit then 32 bit and then 64 bit. And there's what itanium idea of like, oh, here's like a new instruction set. And that just like, no one used that. And it's that AMD came around and just like, just, just add more extensions to x86. And uh, yeah, that makes it come to get in. So that's that's roughly where I just gave up on this version of the project. Um, but I thought it was kind of interesting too to write this in TypeScript, uh, although I'm, it's not usually my choice of language. And on this computer, like it finishes all of the like code generation here in 129 microseconds, which is pretty quick for being used to JavaScript. Okay, I'm gonna switch to the most recent version. Um, so and here, got like two minutes or so, just the two minute one. Yeah, I think I'm almost done. Um, so I just want to show you this. You know, it's a little slower because it needs to run like a make file and stuff. Uh, this is like a C project, uh, and this uses LLVM uh, to to do code generation. So what you can do actually, it spits out. Uh, a, um, a local executable here, ARM64 executable, and we can run it and we'll get a result here, 248, which is by adding the, the arguments, I guess, that the, uh, the what would that be? The start routine from LLVM will give us. 
so yeah that's uh, i'm happy to like dig into any kind of details here or if there's anything in particular you're curious about and remember this is like a hobby project i'm not like no one is like paying me to do this stuff i'm not like a professional uh, uh compiler person so yeah thanks for for listening everyone I'm gonna keep, thank you. I'm gonna keep the screen share on in case there's anything you wanna to point to. Is it time for questions? It is time for questions. Should be some music. Da, da, da. Do you have plans to make it self-hosting? Uh, I That would be fun. I think for now I'm like, no, maybe maybe one day, uh, maybe in another five years. <laughs> uh, Paul asks, is there a language, is there a specific domain you're targeting with this language, web dev, web assembly, other? Yeah, I'm targeting like everything. I wanna take over the world, like everyone should use this program language. No, actually I'm only targeting myself. I'm building this only for myself. And if anyone else at one point wants to use this, that, I mean, that's cool, but I have very low, low expectations. And the domain I'm building it for is um, anything that can run, anything that LLVM can target essentially. So like WebAssembly for the web and you know, ARM64 for this computer I'm, I'm using right now, for example. Uh, I'm not, it's not like, oh, uh, a niche for like web development or a niche for like networking or anything like that. Um, and again, like, as I was saying earlier, the, the drive behind this project is not to build like the best programming language or the best thing for X. It's, it's really just for me to learn and also for to have a little fun thing of my own that I can use for like fun stuff. Do they have mutability or barring rules or? Like, what is the common part that you have where you have fun main and comments? Uh, yeah, sorry. I think your audio was, was cracking up a little bit. Your first yeah, part of so, your question. Yeah, does it, does it have mute, mutability <clears throat> and barring rules? Or otherwise, what is the bottom fun main? Like, what do the arguments mean? It does, yes. So it has, uh, it has the concept that is uh, borrowed from... Uh, a couple of things like Rust is one of them. It's not a straight up Rust like semantics or anything like that, but you have something that, let me zoom even more because it's probably kind of hard. This is maybe even better. So, uh, so yeah, this, it looks like crap probably because this is like a little test function, but I brought it in here because it got a couple of interesting things if someone wanted to try it. So I can run this and we can look at the, uh, the generated code and let me scroll to the, the AST. Uh, actually, no, let's just skip that. Let's, we can just focus on this. This is not going to be interesting. Um, so an ampersand means that it's a pointer. So that means CS here means that it's a pointer to a list of um, uh, integer, 8 bit integers. Does that make sense? And then mute in ahead of it means that it's a mutable pointer. So by default, so this one is not, it's immutable. So if I were to try to do, uh, now I'm not sure if I, I'm in the middle of like changing things. So this might just be like breaking now. Let's see, yes, okay. But if I were to do this and I wasn't in the, in the midst of rewriting this uh, resolver, type resolver, this would say cannot mutate CS because it's immutable. Um, so yeah, it's, does that answer your question, Jacob? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, maybe one last question if anyone has it. You know, see us ask me questions on Twitter or Discord later when I jump in there. Here's my Twitter handle if you uh, if you want to. Do, do you uh, create compilation units and like link them across with each other or is it just like single file? Uh, no, you can, 
I got it set up now. Let's see if we can quickly try it out. Uh, let's see. Oh. It's gonna debug here. Yes, disables optimizations, which actually it doesn't really matter. Uh, examples and I have, let's see. Do I have something? I can just try this. It's, this probably is gonna be chaos. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that this this is an unrelated bug, but um, yes. And what you can do, I have two of those. No, two. So you can you can define a function in like it, it. It works essentially like Go if you're familiar with that. So a directory is the scope in which things can refer to each other, and things that are private that are not exported can refer to each other across files. I personally, I think that's like a much sweeter spot than like the the thing that a lot of other languages like TypeScript, for example, like does where each source file like uh, limits the scope, right? At least for what happens for me in those languages is you start out with like your foo.tsjs or foo.c and you know, you're writing stuff, right? And then it's like, suddenly it's like a big program and you want to break something apart. So you take this function and whatnot, and you move that to a new source file. Now you have to go and do import everywhere they use that, right? And now if like you're using a language that has like, like Python or something like that, you know, that has uh, naming rules for things that are like, you know, uh, that doesn't go between boundaries of modules, you have to change the names of things. It's just a total mess. And yeah, so this language, it, the type of solver right now, it will go. It will go and compile all the files you give it, and then the files in the same directory. It will. It will include those if there are any cross references. So if I added this file on the command line here, we kind of short on time, so I'm not going to do that. But if I did did that, we just call that from the other file. Limited link time optimization. Yes. LLVM gives me that for free. So thank you, LLVM. <laughs> All right, uh, can I cut this off? Any other questions, feel free to uh, use Discord or Twitter. Um, all right, Paul, it's all yours. Thank you, Rasmus. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, okay. can you see my uh, screen now? Yeah, cool. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I will just set a timer so that I get an idea of how long I am. Uh, so hello everyone, today we will talk about uh, search engine architecture. So my name is Paul Majorel. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Fulmi Coton, so you can follow me there. And here is my uh, mini relevant resume. So 2016, I started a project called TonTV. It's a Rust library to build search engine. Um, so if you're familiar with Lucene, it's extremely similar, even the internals, uh, it's like extremely similar to Lucene. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and in 2020, I co-founded a startup called QuickWit. And QuickWit is a distributed search engine for logs. Uh, I will explain in a second uh, what's different when you try to search into logs and what's different when we try to search in a e-commerce website or something like that. Uh, yeah, everything is in Rust. Uh, and I think uh, it's the only slide where I will do a product placement. Uh, if you're interested in QuickWit, please contact me. Uh, I, I, I will not sell my products from now on. Uh, so, what's so specific about uh, QuickWit? Uh, uh, about uh, log search. Uh, so, one difficult part of my job is um, trying to explain people that you cannot use QuickWit in a e-commerce website, for instance, or to search your blog or uh, replace Google or anything like this. So, 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 what we call a lot of things search engines, but they are actually very different shapes and forms and you cannot use any tool for anything uh, so the big difference with log search first one is your data is usually immutable so you can use that as an opportunity for optimization usually you, you will not modify your log so you don't care about deletes and stuff like that 
Also, you don't care about search quality. Uh, there is no algorithm that is here to tell you which line of logs you want. Usually what you have is a query that defines a predicate over your logs, and you want that sorted by date, for instance. Uh, one very important one that uh, people usually miss is the balance between the volume of data that you have and the number of queries that you have is extremely different. So you, you could have like a, a medium-sized startup that is handling 100 terabytes of logs. Uh, it's perfectly normal. And there is only uh, one person uh, that is searching into these logs uh, once a week. Uh, to debug something. That, that, that's a perfectly normal situation. Um, to give you an idea, an e-commerce website like uh, Indeed, uh, it's not e-commerce, but a job search website like uh, Indeed.com, the full index, it fits in RAM. It, it's, uh, it's less than 40 gigabytes. It's, it's, uh, and, and, and it gets hundreds of uh, query per second. So it's, it's a very different balance. Uh, and from that, there is a lot of uh, properties that you can derive on what you want from your search engine. So for instance, if you look at the log search engine, um, if you look at your Elasticsearch uh, indexing your logs, and you try to see what your CPU is spending time on, usually it's spending time on indexing, not on searching. And it will be the other way around uh, on something like indeed.com or Twitter, like the search engine on Twitter or stuff like that. Uh, usually it's cost sensitive. Uh, so when you talk with the teams running that kind of search engine, they see they see uh, the engine as a cost. Like it's not it's not an opportunity to make it better. Like they, they would like to they, they they really care if you get, if you tell them that you can reduce the cost by ten percent, they will be really happy. Uh, if you tell them to the team running uh, I don't know the search engine for Amazon, they 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 will be a little bit scared. Uh, because it's running so much revenue that why would you be cheap on on uh, the search engine of an e-commerce website? Uh, log search, it, it's really cost sensitive. And usually it's uh, multi-index or even multi-tenant, which means that you, you have one cluster and you host a, a lot of index and uh, you want to be able to isolate uh, the behavior of the different index and the different tenants so that people cannot mess with other people uh, in indexes. Okay, so what's the plan for today? Uh, we're gonna talk about the usual architecture for blocks of the distributed search. Uh, it's called share nothing. Maybe uh, some of you are familiar with this. And then we'll talk about the different type of architecture called shared disk. Um, it will be very high level. I will not explain how search works. Uh, we will put the architecture hat on. Uh, for this talk, and uh, if we have time, we will discuss how we actually. Uh, so, so quickly to the shared disk architecture. Uh, after that, we can discuss what what kind of tricks we use to actually make that work because it's a uh, it is it, it's not easy to make a shared shared disk architecture for for uh, for search. All right, so shared disk uh, uh, sh shared nothing architecture super simple. The idea is you have a big data set. You split it. That's called sharding. Uh, so if you have more data, you split it more. Uh, that's as simple as this. And then you probably want to have replication as well for availability, durability, and everything. So you, if if you want to deal with more queries, you just add replicas. So for log search, we said that we don't have that many queries, and we have a lot of data. So usually you you will have like two replica and uh, and many shards. Um, so. It's called share nothing because uh, let, let, let's forget about the uh, y axis here, the, the replica axis. Uh, like the, the shards are not sharing any data. Every single node has its own SSD, it has its own piece of data, and it, it does work on it, but it doesn't care about uh, the other piece of the data set. And um, now, if we want to look at what's happen, what's happening when you run a search query. Uh, usually, the query comes to uh, what what I call, what some people call uh, the root node. The root node will be in charge of uh, picking a, a set of replica for uh, covering all of the shards, and it will dispatch the query. The replica will do the computation. They will send back the results. The root node merge the results, and voila, you you get. You get to send the result back to the user. Um, 
So, uh, a couple of things that are interesting here. Um, Shannon thing is brilliant. The brilliant thing here is when you think about it, there is three pieces of data that we are uh, dealing with here, the query, the result sets, and the data. The idea of share nothing is the big thing is the data. So let's collocate it with uh, the, the compute. And thanks to that, we are not moving the data anymore. And we are moving around the query and the result set. And those are small. Uh, so obviously, it's going to be way better than anything else. Um, that's a good idea. Uh, uh, yeah, let's make that clear. It's a, it's a very good idea. Um, so now let's look at the indexing pass. Uh, you send the documents. Uh, sharding happens by some routing logic. Uh, it could be, for instance, hashing on the document ID. You identify that the document goes to shard one, for instance, and you send it to um, one. Uh, usually, there is like a notion of leader node uh, for your shards or so within your replica sets. Uh, there is one node that has a specific wall and it will take care of the documents, send it to other replicas. And um, if you do document replication like Elasticsearch, what will happen here is every single uh, replica will do the indexing in independently. So here there is a little bit of waste uh, done. You index your, so in, in, with two replicas, you're doing the, the indexing job twice. And if you remember what I said before, for logs, uh, most of your CPU is wasted in indexing, not in searching. So that's, that's quite a lot of waste, actually. Um, and another problem uh, that you have here is you might notice that uh, we are running indexing and searching on the same hardware. And so I'm going to say something a little bit subtle here. Uh, so indexing, it's a throughput game. Usually what, when you do indexing and, and you're uh, a sysadmin looking at your uh, hardware and you look at the CPU usage, you are very happy if you see your CPU at 90% of its capacity. Uh, you, you want all of the resources your system to be used. Uh, because what you want to maximize is the throughput, the indexing throughput of your machine. Uh, any percent of CPU that is not used is wasted. Search is a very different story. Um, for search, you are what, what you want is is a low latency. So you want to enjoy a low latency. Uh, you want the result to come back as fast as possible. And so if your CPU is running at 90%, uh, Yes, that's, that's Q series there, but basically that means that sometimes you will run a query and there will be a lot of people uh, waiting for their results and you will be waiting in a queue and it will really hurt your latency. Especially it will really hurt your tail latency, so the distribution of, uh, of uh, you have a distribution of latency and uh, like the, the worst uh, queries will be even worse uh, if, if your CPU has a uh, a, a lot of uh, contention. In this uh, picture, yes. oh, sorry. when you say we do most of the heavy lifting, are you it, um, are you talking about the replica two set, or are you talking about every individual? Uh, yeah, no, I I I, I put this uh, this bubble, uh, this comic bubble here, just to say that the root node doesn't do much, and the leaf nodes are the one doing all of the computation, uh, crunching. So that I didn't mean uh, leaf node two in particular, but actually there is a phenomenon that's that's actually interesting. So uh, often what happens is you you uh, you you have one of those shards that has more work than the other, or maybe. Um, the node that is hosting this uh, shard is hosting another tenant that is doing a lot of work and therefore it will be much slower than the other nodes. And some, there is something that uh, an important takeaway here that applies to search, but even a lot of other stuff. Um, so here's the overall latency from the point of view of the user. You will, the user will get back the results when all of the nodes have finished their work, right? And so what you end up is the latency seen by the user is actually the max of the latency of all of the shards, right? And when you think about it, the max is it's like a function that takes your tail latencies and are putting it, it as an average latency that you will get. So you, we really care about the latency in a distributed uh, environment and 
it's way more important when uh, you are dealing with a lot of shards. And uh, yeah, so so uh, even small things like not having a GC is very helpful here. Uh, if, yeah, so everything, is, the fact that we are running in, in Rust is actually uh, helping us there. But uh, here, yeah, contention is important. Uh, ideally, we want our nodes, our sessions to, to, to not have their CPU at 100% of the time. Um, yes, and so I, 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 I'm just gonna quote uh, Datadog here. So they released a, a blog post recently uh, explaining why they moved from a share nothing architecture to a shared disk architecture. Uh, it's a new product called Husky that is uh, incidentally very close to what QuickWit does. It's it's really a coincidence. Uh, so we 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 are discussing. Uh, uh, I've discussed with engineers at Datadog uh, in the past. I've been working on that uh, before we started QuickWit in in secret. So it's it's uh, it's really a coincidence, and it's really interesting to see what they have to say. So. Talking about the shared nothing architecture, they said it worked quite well in the beginning, but it didn't take long for the quacks to show. The primary problem was that within a multi-tenant cluster, a single misbehaving node could end up disrupting the experience of all tenants, and in the worst case, makes the entire cluster unavailable. That was what I was saying uh, before. It's a little bit difficult with this architecture to isolate your tenant correctly. Uh, and yeah. I think I, I went through all, all of these pros and cons. So yeah, the pros I should emphasize. So uh, data doesn't move. Uh, time to search, it's uh, like when you insert a document, how long does it take for it to be searchable? Uh, so it's usually better with this architecture. With a shared disk, as we will see, we have a latency of around 30 seconds or one minute uh, between the moment of insertion and being available. Mutability and the cons, I, I think I covered them. Uh, so I, I said, I said, uh, what's brilliant about the uh, share nothing is that the like the bulk of the data is not moving around. Uh, so so it, it makes it obvious that it's the best architecture. But something happened since uh, the eighties. Uh, share nothing got pop is is popular since the the eighties eighty five. Uh, so, so the big difference is network got much faster. So if you go in your data center right now, usually whatever node you take on AWS, uh, so we'll have uh, 10 gigabit per second uh, network. So it's a very different environment than it used to be before. Um, so maybe we can do a shared disk. That's a spoiler, we, we do shared disk. Okay, so <laughs> shared disk architecture, uh, we start from the indexing path now. Um, so first big difference, we have uh, different nodes to run indexing and different nodes to run search, uh, which is great because that means if, if you recall what I said, we can use our full CPU for indexing and for search, we uh, can have them rest a little bit and be ready for uh, queries and delivering uh, good latencies. Uh, so we still need to have some kind of uh, system to to have our document replicated after injection uh, ingestion otherwise we will not be durable so we rely on an external distributed queue like kafka or kinesis uh, so in in the case of quickwit we plug ourselves directly to kafka and indexing nodes will consume this distributed queue and produce a piece of index that we call a split and it's it's a file uh, we'll see how the file looks like uh, it's a file and we upload that on a shared storage um so it, most of the time it's amazon s3 but it could be something else uh hdfs or uh minio or whatever and uh and and then we have another piece of uh another component that is in charge of storing metadata so right now we offer different alternatives but the most solid one is uh postgresql so you have a SQL database that contains very little data, but it's it's basically the list of splits that there is. Um, so it, it's very light. We 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 don't send much data to to this meta store. And then let's look at what happens on the on the search path. Uh, so the user sends a query to the root node, that's the same as before. 
the root node will discuss with PostgreSQL to ask what is the list of fits uh, on which the uh, uh, query should run. So there is something interesting happening here. There is pruning happening. Um, so with each spits, with each spits, um, we store some metadata like the start and the end timestamp. And usually, user queries uh, they have a time period that they are interested in. So we target this, and we can only uh, run the query on a subset of of, of our splits, uh, which is a very nice optimization. We also have a tagging system to also do pruning on tags. Uh, so then the root node dispatch uh, the query on a set of nodes. So here there is no uh, tie between, there is no coupling between the leaf nodes, the nodes that are in charge of running the search, and the data. So any node can run any query, which is very nice because if we have a big cluster, now we can run on any set of nodes. Uh, we can pick the ones that are uh, so this PZ, or we can pick all of them, or we can do it with any strategy that we want, uh, with, which is really nice. And then the nodes will uh, fetch the data straight from Amazon S3 and run the search and return the result and so on. So um, two very big things here. So leaf nodes are entirely stateless, which is extremely nice. So you can add new nodes and remove new nodes as you want, uh, if you want to scale your system. So way uh, we like sharding before was a little bit static. So most systems they will ask you to to define the number of shards that you want uh, upfront. Here we don't need that. We don't have a strict notion of uh, shard. It's just that you will have more more splits that will be uh, generated, uh, and so yeah, it, it's way more scalable. Um, and also. Uh, very important. All of your state is in PostgreSQL and Amazon S3. Boring technologies, and people love to put their state on boring technology because you just sleep better at night. Um, so Amazon S3 has a great durability. Uh, everybody loves it. Uh, it's replicated on different region. It's uh, it's 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 great uh, if if you want to sleep well. Um, and another thing that you really makes. Uh, people into log management salivate here it's very cheap 25 dollars per terabyte and this includes replication uh it's much cheaper than if you were trying to put that on ssds uh tied to your nodes uh so i think we don't have much time left uh so i'm just gonna talk a second about one thing that we do that is cool to, to make that work so s3 gives you an interface uh to to fetch range of bytes, so we don't have to download entire splits. Uh, we read. It's not exactly as if you were reading from a hard disk. It's you. You have to give a start offset and an end offset, and uh, and, and yeah. And the main trouble to make this whole thing work is the latency. So you have a latency of seventy milliseconds. And so one thing that we do is, um, if you were to open. Uh, tensive index or Lucene index, usually it starts by reading a bunch of footer, a bunch of headers that are very small, but they are here and there, and it's uh, stuff that you have to do, and it sucks because they have to be done sequentially, so you read a piece of the file that tells you, oh, please read this other piece of file at this index of the file and stuff like that. So I, I logged uh, how many reads was done, and we do 28 reads to open a single uh, Tantivy segment. It's only 34 kilobytes. And the trick uh, that we use here in QuickWit is we first we concatenate all of these files. So it's actually only one file in QuickWit. And uh, we ship uh, just a bit of metadata saying where each file starts. Uh, so we, we say, OK, so the position, it's from here to there, and, and so on. And then uh, we have what we call a turbo cache uh, that is uh, just a, a static cache of these 28 reads uh, so that when QuickWit opens a, an index, it just uh, downloads the 34 bytes uh, that we were talking about. And, and that's it. it. It will hit this cache instead of hitting S3 when it needs to do all of these reads. So it's, it's ready. Uh, in 70 milliseconds, it's ready to, to search into this index. So that's what makes it possible for us to be stateless. I think uh, I'm 22 minutes in, so 
Maybe we should stop and if people have questions. Uh, I have the Discord open, so if, if you want to ask a question, Discord. For the shyest. Um... I love your uh, graphs, by the way. I don't know. I, are you using that hand drawn library? <laughs> It's uh yeah I think everyone should use this thing. It's called Excalibur. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's really great for that kind of architecture stuff. I have a question for you, Paul. What? Yes. So what happens if uh, or how does indexes work here? Like. Can I have a custom index here somehow that says, you know, create a an index on like these two things like smashed together as like a key or something like that? And if I have that capability, like what happens if I want to like update an index or change that? Do you have to stop the world or is there can you kind of, you know, I'm thinking like if that propagates to one of the leaf nodes but not the other, you might have a race condition. Like, how does that work? Uh so concatenating like two things, uh, quick, we don't do it yet. Um, so you, 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 you define a doc mapping in quick uh, and right now the functionality is, is pretty simple. So you, you give uh, the list of, uh, uh, fields that you have, their types, and you can say if you want to index position and stuff like that, so that you can run fresh query, but you cannot do things like, oh, I'd like to map uh two fields to the same field uh, to, to 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 do what you described uh so you will have to do that up front um change of schema we don't support them yet uh, but we will support them soon uh it's easier in our case because um we yeah as, as i said we are it's it's easier and impossible at the same time. <laughs> so um, we we are we are working on uh, immutable data and we keep our splits immutable. So we won't re-index your data. Uh, we we won't re-index the past. But so our plan for dealing with a change of schema is um, basically new splits will use a new schema and the query the incoming query will be interpreted. Uh, using the schema of uh, each split. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so let's say that you uh, forward to index positions, for instance, then you will add position for a field. The position are useful if you want to run stress queries. So if you have several terms and you want to force uh, selecting documents that contain all of these terms one after each other. Uh, new splits will be able to run this query. The old splits will not be able to run this query, and and yeah, it will suck a little in the sense that we will uh, merge search results from the old world and the new world, and we will do a best effort to to run a query that makes sense on the on the old splits. Thanks, Paul. Is this um? compatible with the Elastic API? Like are people able to switch to use this without any changes or or not at all? I, I'm not sure how much it was just influenced or, or like an alternative to it or? Yeah, uh, so it's not really, uh, the API is not really compatible. So we did, uh, we, we targeted compatibility for some uh, sub part of the API uh, aggregation is compatible with uh, elastic searches because people have complicated application that are built on top of elastic and we thought that it might uh, make the migration easier um, ingestion we have a pseudo compatible api just to be able to plug ourselves to like log shipping tools like vector uh, but actually the semantic is slightly different so it's it just makes it possible to 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 plug uh, your your log shipper uh, to quick with in in a easier manner. Uh, yeah, apart from that, we are not really compatible. A lot of people ask us if it's possible, especially to to interface with Kibana. 
uh, we will most likely not support Kibana uh, at least anytime soon and target Grafana instead. Uh, so Kibana is has a very large uh, API surface. Uh, so it it will make it it makes it really difficult for us to to try to target Kibana. Does that answer your question? Well, we'll assume yes. Awesome. Any other questions? Sweet. Um, thank you, Paul. This was really great. Um, and Rasmus, too. Thank you both for uh, coming and share. It was awesome to have you. Um, just remind everyone that this will be available on YouTube. I'll post in Discord and in the meetup link. Um, and if uh, Paul and Rasmus want to share any other links in the Discord channel or send them to me and I'll, I'll post them there for anyone uh, to ask or to, to follow. Um, yeah, I'm definitely curious to see your whole slides and uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them. Paul. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right, I'm uh, gonna call this one now. See y'all. See ya, bye-bye. See you. Bye.